The new podcast, After Jackson, Cleveland's Next Mayor, from Ideastream Public Media. Check out After Jackson, Cleveland's Next Mayor, wherever you get your podcasts, and visit ideastream.org slash afterjackson for more. Cleveland mayoral debate, Voters First, is made possible by grants from the Cleveland Foundation and the George Gunn Foundation. Westfield Studio Theater in the Idea Center at Playhouse Square, right here in downtown Cleveland. Welcome to the Cleveland mayoral debate, Voters First. I'm Nick Castell, a senior reporter at IdeaStream Public Media and the host of After Jackson, our podcast chronicling the 2021 mayor's race. Cleveland Mayor Frank Jackson is retiring, and for the first time in 16 years, the city will elect a new leader. Early voting began today and will continue through the primary election on September 14th. Two of the seven candidates will emerge from that primary to face off in the November general election. This is the second of two debates coordinated by Ideastream Public Media and the City Club of Cleveland, a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization and one of the oldest free speech forums in the United States. The rules for tonight have been agreed to by all campaigns. Additional partners are the Press Club of Cleveland and the Northeast Ohio Solutions Journalism Collaborative, a partnership of nearly two dozen media organizations, including Ideastream. We welcome those watching on WVIZ, listening on WCPN, and streaming the event live. At the beginning of the summer, we polled the community to ask what issues are most important to you. Last week, Northeast Ohioans asked the candidates their questions about public safety, racial equity, health equity, housing, and transparency in government. If you missed that debate, you can watch it at cityclub.org. Tonight, the candidates will debate on jobs and economic development, transportation and the environment, and public education. Just like last week, our questions tonight come from you, though I may have follow-up questions. The questions have not been shared with the candidates in advance. Candidates will have 60 seconds to answer each question, and when, when rebuttals are needed at my discretion, that person will receive 30 seconds. Not every candidate will answer every question. We will not have opening statements tonight as the candidates offered those last week. Instead, we'll use that time for more questions and more interaction between the candidates. At the end of the debate, each candidate will have 60 seconds for a closing statement. I'd like to now introduce the seven people here who are running for mayor of Cleveland. One of them is going to be Cleveland's next mayor. Former mayor and U.S. Congressman Dennis Kucinich, Councilman Bashir Jones of Ward 7, State Senator Sandra Williams, former Councilman Zach Reed from Ward 2, nonprofit executive Justin Bibb, attorney Ross DeBello, and Kevin Kelly, the council president and councilman from Ward 13. We're now going to begin with questions from you submitted over the past several months. Following each question, I'll ask several of the candidates to answer before moving on to the next. We begin tonight on the topic of education. The schools, as we all know, have faced unique challenges during the coronavirus pandemic. The Cleveland Metropolitan School District moved from in-person instruction to fully remote learning, and many students were lost in the transition. Our first question comes from John Shee of Shaker Heights. How do you plan on helping the increasing number of CMSD students who had fallen behind during the pandemic? And I'll put this question first to Senator Sandra Williams. How will you help increase, how will you help the increasing number of CMSD students who have fallen behind during the pandemic, Senator? Thank you so much for the question and thank you all for having us here again today. It is my honor. Uh, first of all, as you all know, I was the sponsor of the Cleveland Plan, which increased graduation rates from 
47% to over 80% and 86% if you're looking at the five-year graduation rate. I believe the first thing we need to do to address the issue of the pandemic in education is to number one, make sure we can close the digital divide that has hurt so many families and who prevented a lot of families from actually going to school online during the pandemic. Secondly, I think we need to have an intensive approach, an intensive targeted approach for remedial education for the students that have been left behind. I also believe, and I've always believed this, that we should have school uh, tutoring before school after school and on the weekends for those students who have fallen behind. Because see, this is not a new issue. Students have been falling behind for a very Senator, long time. Thank you, thank you. Councilman Jones, I'll put the question to you next. Thank you so much. You know, as council person, I work with the great principal over at Wade Park, Dr. Buddy. And what we did was partner CMSD along with Digital C, and we brought, made sure that residents and students had laptops, we made sure that they had iPads, and we purchased that. We also have this beautiful group within Ward 7 called uh, PCs for People. You know, so what we have to do is make sure that we are investing in wraparound services for our children. The fact is that 85% of student achievement has nothing to do with the school you go to, but with the problems that you bring. So we gotta make sure that we are investing in wraparound services and making sure that we end the digital divide. In Ward 7, we also have Digital C. Digital C is doing some phenomenal, phenomenal work in, uh, in alleviating this, this major issue that we have with this digital divide. We're putting, <coughs> right now in Ward 7, we've partnered with CMHA, and we're putting these uh, equipments on the buildings to make sure that every single resident has Wi-Fi. That's the key. Councilman, thank you very much. Uh, we'll go next now to Council President Kevin Kelly. Same question for you. Uh, thank you, Nick. Let's start with the very notion that we have to all accept is that our scholars must succeed if we as a city are going to succeed. And to answer the gentleman's question, we need to start with an honest assessment of what was lost. My daughter is a, going into sixth grade in CMSD, and I had the opportunity to kind of look over her shoulder during instruction, and the, these teachers not only had to teach subject matter, but they had to instruct kids on how to upload their homework assignments and how to how they would like, if there's a different device, how do you upload, how do you participate in class? Many kids didn't sign on, many kids were lost. We were not in a position to lose a year. We need to make a, a judgment, we need an assessment of every child and their needs, and we need to decide, can we bring that student back up um, and keep them at grade level through tutoring and through the other support, or do we need to look at, at repeating? But whenever possible, we need to support that child and make sure that every child that lost a step at all thank you. during this year is supported. Thank you. Staying on, staying on the topic of education now, we'll hear from Kenneth Valentine. He's 10 years old and in the fifth grade in a school on the west side. ¿Cuál es tu relación con la comunidad hispana y qué harás en los primeros 90 días para mejorar mi educación? And I will give you the translation, courtesy of our own producer, Natalia Garcia. Uh, Congressman Kucinich, we'll begin with you. The question is, what is your relationship with the Hispanic community, and what will you do in the first 90 days to improve my education, Kenneth asks. Well, uh, let me begin by saying that uh, yo creo que los hispanos americanos son ciudadanos muy importante a futuro de uh, la ciudad de Cleveland. Uh, entonces, es muy importante por los niños. Uh, and so I, I'm, I believe that uh, Hispanic Americans are extremely important to the city, and I think they want the same things that all parents want. They want to make sure schools are safe. But they want to make sure the children of, who are attending the schools are going to be cared for. I intend to initiate a lead paint or lead testing program to make sure that every child that could be exposed to lead paint or lead pipes is tested because that is one of the major impediments to children learning. I'm going to see the administrative costs cut and the Cleveland Board of Education because they're twice what many major school districts are and put the money back into the classrooms. And I'm going to do something else, and that is to I give the parents you. a chance to have a voice. We're going to start talking about, once and for all, an elected school system again. Give the parents a voice once again. Congressman, thank you very much. Uh, Justin Bibb, I'll, I'll go to you next. What is your answer to Kenneth's question? Well, I want, I want to thank Kenneth uh, for the question uh, because 
Our Hispanic population is a key part of our community and they deserve honest, real representation uh, from the next mayor in our city. And as you think about what's at stake in this ele election, improving public education <clears throat> is critical. Uh, State Senator Sandra Williams talked about the Cleveland plan and I believe the Cleveland plan was a good step in the right direction. But we've gone from an F to a D in just 10 years and that's not good enough for me. So number one, we need to address the learning loss that we've seen in this pandemic. I believe that requires more high dosage tutoring and mentoring year round for all of our children inside CMSD. We need to better invest in our teachers and more teacher quality, teacher effectiveness programs so our teachers have the skills and resources they need to uplift our children day in and day out. And as mayor, I wanna bring back our apprenticeship programs in every CMSD high school so our kids can be Mr. ready Bibb, to compete you. in the 21st century knowledge-based economy. We'll turn now to uh, uh, Councilman Zach Reed. Same question for you, your relationship with the Hispanic community and what will you do to improve education? Well, I've had a very broad and good relationship with the Hispanic community over the years. Uh, I used to be the photographer for Marion Rush when she had the, the newspaper and the magazine in the Hispanic community. Uh, so my relationship with the Hispanic community goes back a, a long, long way. Secondly, what I'll do to help that young man, and I appreciate that young man stepping up to the plate and asking, that question, uh, asking the question. I mean, what we gotta do is we gotta go into those schools and talk to the teachers, talk to the parents, and, set, and see what type of relationship can we build. We're never going to be able to go to the next level here in the city of Cleveland if we don't build a world-class, first-class educational system in the city of Cleveland. And, that, and, and, and the census that just came out shows that, that the Hispanic community is growing in the city of Cleveland and throughout this region. So it is paramount for us to go and talk to our Hispanic students and find out how we can ensure that they're job ready on day one to go out there and help us to rebuild this city. Thank you very much, Councilman Reed. Uh, Councilman Jones, uh, 30 seconds. You know, I just wanna say that in order for us to truly have an impact on the Hispanic community, we must work with the Hispanic community. I had the chance to, just the last week, a couple weeks ago rather, sit down with the Young Lords, which is an Hispanic American uh, community activist. We need to put them into place and making sure that they have a place in this city. The city of Cleveland does not respect the Hispanic community the way it deserves. It's the fast and growing community, not only in Cleveland, but in this country. We have to make sure that there's no language barriers in city services, as well as making sure that we have more Hispanic teachers that are working within CMSD. Councilman, thank you very much. We will move on now to what Cleveland students are learning in the classroom. What are Cleveland's diverse communities experiencing when they walk through the door of a CMSD school? And we'll go now to a question from Jessica Vallejo of the Edgewater neighborhood. So recent studies have shown that 87% of our country's state history standards do not talk about Native Americans after the year 1900. With the current attacks and bans on discussions about race in the classroom, how can you as mayor guarantee that my indigenous children and their non-Native friends will have access to this education, will be able to learn about their history, Native American history, the people, as well as the history of our black and brown brothers and sisters? Mr. Rostabello, uh, you'll get a first crack at this question. Thank you for the, the question, Jessica. I think this is infusing books, art, music, everywhere we can. We're gonna lobby, lobby, lobby at the state level. If that ship sails, that ship sails. But this is about getting kids to our museums, getting kids to our libraries, make sure, making sure our classrooms are stocked with all cultures, right? Education is history. You learn from history to get better in the future. So I also think that this gets to listening to the <coughs> teachers union as to how they can help inform us on, on where our blind spots are and diversifying every CMSD school teacher staff. So if I'm victorious in November, we will start looking at the staffs of every school and we will make sure that whichever school your child is going to, will have that flavor and that historic education, true history. Mr. DiBello, thank you very much. Councilman Jones, uh, how do you believe that Cleveland schools should teach indigenous and black history in the classroom? Listen, I'm a, I'm a graduate from Morehouse College, honors grad. My degree was African studies. 
If anybody understand this, black people understand this. Uh, when you look at the history book starting with 1865, and we know very well that uh, we have a history long before that. So what we have to do is we have to work with, number one, we need new books. And we have to have teachers that are culturally competent, that understands the children that they are educating. I mean, it, it doesn't make sense that you have the fact that the majority of children that are suspended are black boys, are black boys. Why? Because if you don't understand them, you can't help them. And you know, this is not just words. I've been in the classrooms. No one here has been in more classrooms than I have. No one has spoken at more graduations in CMSD than I have. I have been working with the schools, teaching history, teaching leadership. And I think that's important. You have to, un in order to help somebody, you have to understand where they come from. Thank you, Councilman. Senator Williams, same question for you. Uh, thank you so much. And I can tell you this. If you don't know your history, you are doomed to repeat some of the bad things that have happened in your history. So I agree with the lady who asked this question. Years ago, I sponsored a bill that would require school districts across the state of Ohio to teach not only black history, but every other type of history, Latinx, Asian, indigenous people across the state. And the feedback that I got was that we have too many requirements right now under our educational system. But as the mayor of this city, I can work with the CMSD executive director or CEO to make sure that it is included within our history system. We don't have to depend on the state level to get something done that we know needs to be done. We can do it on our own by making sure that we work within the realms of the system and teach it in every history class in the CMSD district. I would also say this, there are current bills going through the legislature that might Thank prevent you, us from actually doing that, but I will work on that. Thank you. All right, I had two requests here. Council President Kelly, first 30 seconds, and then Councilman Reed will go to you. Thank you. Council President. Thank you, Nick. Um, we just all have to acknowledge that indigenous people didn't write these history books. And we've talked about the teachers, and to uh, double down on what Senator Williams said, it all comes to who do you appoint to the board. And that's the mayor's responsibility. And that's where I will commit to make sure that I only appoint members to the board that hold these values to teach true history. Thank you. Thank you very much, Council President. Uh, uh, Councilman Reed will go to you, and then I did hear from Mr. Bibb. So, Councilman Reed. Well, we can talk about history, and we can talk about history books. Let's talk about right now. As Councilman, I stood on the floor of City Council. I walked and talked with those indigenous individuals at every base, uh, at every home opener, and talked about the fact that the Wahoo was a was a basically a racist uh, a symbol. And I also work with the indigenous people. So, at the end of the day, we can talk about what we've done in the past. I'm telling you what I've done recently to ensure that now the Indians are now called the Guardians. Thank you very much, Councilman. Uh, Mr. Bibb will go to you, then we'll have to move on to the next question. I think we have to ground this conversation in real facts and understand the real nuance of what's at stake in this election. The mayor has a moral responsibility to improve public education, and we can't take that role lightly. And now more than ever, we need to have an aggressive strategy to hire more teachers of color that look like our students, that share their lived experience, but also we gotta stop teaching to the test and really ground in our curriculum in what students wanna learn day in and day out. That's the kind of policy change we need right now inside CMSD. Thank you very much, Mr. Bibb. On to our next question. Public education has a lot of competition in Northeast Ohio from private and parochial schools, and school vouchers make it easier to choose an alternative. This next question is about how Cleveland schools can compete, and it comes from Leah Hudnall and her son, Dom, in Mill Creek. Hi, we come from a long line of proud Cleveland Public School graduates. I myself graduated from a Cleveland Public School, and my son here is enrolled in preschool in a CMSD school. Many times perception outweighs reality on the quality that we have in our public education system. What will you and your administration do to attract new young families who will enroll their children in CMSD. Council President Kelly, first to, first to you. Uh, thank you, this is, this is a very important question. And let me begin by saying, I have had my children in Catholic schools, I've had my kids in charter schools, and I've had my kids in CMSD schools. The parent needs to pick the best option for the child. And right now, we are having a great experience in CMSD, and I think that this is, there is so much potential that's there. 
uh, we have to look at what are we doing to attract more families. Well, we left a charter school to go to a CMSD school because there was an outreach coordinator that reached out to us that showed us how great this education could be, the support that my daughter would get in a CMSD school. We need to make sure that we have, we have outreach coordinators, that we have family coordinators that are reaching directly out to families to, to bring them in and show them all the great opportunities that CMSD provides because there are endless, endless possibilities uh, it, that CMSD offers to kids. There are charter schools closing all the time. There are charter schools that are, that are trading, you know, they're being sold. We need to go after Thank those families. Much. Thank you. I know there's a couple people who want to get in on this. Uh, first, we're going to go, though, to Mr. Bibb. You've got, uh, you got a minute. Yeah, I, I want to say good to see you, Leah. And by the way, Dom is a rock star. Um, and you deserve to have a public education system that works for you and your family. And every child and family inside CMSD deserves that basic fundamental right. And it is critical that we get this moment right to make sure we can grow our population and grow our tax base over time. So there's a couple things we can do. Number one, as I said before, we gotta better invest in our teachers and give them the resources they need to be effective in the classroom. Secondly, we gotta get real about more investments in out of school time supports to help support our children, like investments in the Boys and Girls Club, investments in organizations like the Horizon Education Academy. Those types of programs go a long way to meet the whole needs of our child. And without that comprehensive approach, we can't have a thriving public education system that works for all of our families. Thank you very much, Mr. Bibb. Congressman Kucinich, same question for you. Uh, what will your administration do to attract young families to enroll their children in CMSD? The first thing we're going to do is to assure the people that the schools are safe because that's the first question that parents have. Uh, the next thing is let people know that the standards of the Cleveland Metropolitan School District are for high quality education. We want education to be well funded, but, and it is, but I pointed out earlier, administrative costs are, are rising fast and the money instead should go into after school programs, should go to teacher salaries, should go to meet the needs of the children. And in addition to that, I wanna see a universal pre-kindergarten program more fully developed in the Cleveland school system so that children will have a chance to get a very quick start with reading skills, math, and, and just basic learning skills. And we're gonna do something about lead poisoning. I wanna make that very clear to everyone who's listening. We must test the children, and if they have a problem, we have to work on, on their health as well. Thank you very much, Congressman. Uh, Councilman Jones, thank you for your patience. You've got 30 seconds on this thank question. Thank you so much. In order to make a change, you have to first understand it. You know, working over at Glenville and JFK, working over at Glenville with Ms. Ms. Principal Jackie Bell, and if you were to sit down and listen to her, you will see what the issues are. You know, I'm not just talking about what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna tell you what I've done. I've worked with the schools, and what the schools need is more funding towards social emotional programming. Children are bringing issues to the classroom, so they don't have no time to deal with math. In my administration, we're going to invest in more wrap around services. Thank you very much, Councilman Jones. Senator Williams, uh, same question to you. How do you attract new young families who will enroll their children in Cleveland schools? 30 seconds. Thank you very much. Well, listen, uh, uh, parents come to me all the time talking about the problems that we have in this Cleveland public school system and our grade card rating. The first thing I will let them know is the grade card system that we have in place on the state level is not a direct an accurate reflection of what's happening within the Cleveland Municipal School District. I would sit down with the parents and the teachers, making sure we meet with those parents who are interested in bringing their students to the City of Cleveland School District and tell them all the great things that we are doing. We have people coming from outside of the City of Cleveland putting their children in our school, like the Cleveland School of Arts, like the Senator, John so Hay much. High School. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Uh, Councilman Reed, I would like to hear from you on this. Well, as a proud graduate of the Cleveland Public School System, John F. Kennedy, I can tell you firsthand, when I left that school, I was ready to go to work and take on the task of society. And if we want to attract parents to put their children into the school system, we first, got, we first have to ensure that they know when that child graduates that they're ready to take on the task of our society and that they're job ready. And we need to reimagine education. We need to take a school like Collinwood and reimagine Collinwood to be a vocational school. 
Why do we only have Councilman, one vote? Councilman, thank you so much. I know it said a minute there. You had 30 seconds for that one. My apologies for the confusion. And uh, uh, I know you're on a roll there. Uh, but Mr. DiBello, uh, also to you, 30 seconds. Thanks, Nick. Leah, by the end of my term, we're going to be stealing kids from private and charter schools. We're going to get creative with our curriculum. We're going to build on this summer program in school, after school. We're going to be doing art, music, sports. We're going to expand on the chess program they do it at Gallagher. We're going to be sending our kids to City Dogs and con continuing reading with no judgment. We're going to get creative, create independent critical thought because that's what we need now more than ever. Thank you very much, Mr. DiBello. We'll move on to our next question here. I thank you all for your eagerness and participation in this. We've also got a lot of great questions to get to. Uh, the next topic identified by our community as important in this race is jobs and the economy, particularly as Cleveland recovers from the coronavirus pandemic. Our first question on this topic comes from Rhonda Peoples in the Stockyards neighborhood. What do you see as the biggest challenges facing Cleveland residents in terms of getting jobs that pay a living wage? So the question again is, what do you see as the biggest challenges facing Cleveland residents in terms of getting jobs that pay a living wage? And uh, Councilman Reed, we'll begin with you. Well, the first thing is that you've got to put somebody in public office that understands that making $15 an hour is the way to go. The wages in the city of Cleveland, as it relates to having a good job, uh, are just too low. And one of my opponents literally stepped up to the plate, went to Columbus, and got the people in Columbus to, to ensure that the people in the city of Cleveland could not make $15 an hour. And I oppose, that, I oppose the fact that you would go to Columbus and do that. Secondly, the thing we've got to do is, like I just said, we've got to ensure that we got an educational system that is second to none. If we put an educational system that is second to none, then these individuals in our wards and in our communities, business leaders, they will know then that a person that graduated from Cleveland Public Schools now is ready to go to work in your uh, business, and then they're ready on day one to be able to go to the next level as it relates to working and making a business a better business. But first of all, we have to ensure that much, we have Councilman. a good wage. Seen a lot of hands up. Uh, uh, Councilman, I know you did mention Council President Kelly and the fight over raising Cleveland's minimum wage. I want to give you 30 seconds to rebut. Thank you. I've always supported raising the minimum wage. I have ever since, all, everything that I've said has been consistent, but the Cleveland only plan is the one I opposed. And for all of, all of my uh, Mr. Reed's talk, I will remind him that he voted against it too on council. And I want to thank you for supporting my, my understanding that Cleveland only would be detrimental for our economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Council President. Uh, Zach, I, uh, I will give you uh, just a few seconds here to respond, then we got to move on. Let's be clear. I went out and I worked to get people to sign a petition to ensure that they can make $15 an hour. Do you want to so, public record? So at the end of the day, What's at the end of the day, I support no. $15 an hour. I went to the street to ensure that they can make $15 an hour, and you as you council president, no. and you as council president you made the decision not no to accept me. The you voted no and you made with the me, decision. and I want to thank you for that. It was a and right made, decision. And you made the decision thank you, to not Thank you both, it. gentlemen. Uh, Ross DiBello, I had you on my list for the full time, so uh, the floor is yours, sir. Rhonda, Zach's right. In 2012, I was working at the casino. They told us we'd sign up to get $6 an hour plus tips. The tips were supposed to be there. Our first biannual paycheck came. There were no tips. Four of my coworkers went to their supervisors, were crying their eyes out, didn't know where they were gonna go next. All four of those coworkers, black females. We do not have an economy set up for Clevelanders. We give away millions of our tax dollars to millionaires and billionaires, all for the promise of 700 jobs here, 1,200 jobs there. But it's not me, you, and our neighbors that see those jobs, right? So this crony capitalism has to end. We have to fund small and new businesses in the outer neighborhoods with our tax dollars, not increasing the wealth of a select few so we can get re-election after re-election. We need more than service industry jobs downtown. Thank you very much, Mr. DiBello. I, I know I see a few hands up here. Uh, Councilman Jones, you are on my list for the full answer. Thank you so much. You know, it's one thing about talking, but you got to walk it. And that's the problem is that a lot of people just talk, but there's no action behind it. 
when you, when you talk about economy, there is no economy without education. And that's why I want to make sure that I am going to be an education mayor. And not only is it important when it comes to economy and making sure that people are with a living wage, but you also have to make sure you are attracting business. And what we have to do is make sure that we have a city hall, a city hall that is prepared to bring in new businesses. And that's what I've done in Ward 7. I've done it in Ward 7. Pay attention to what we've done in Ward 7 in only two and a half years. Take a year away from COVID, and the fourth year is not even done until January. Two and a half years, we brought in we, Ron Richards, and India Lee, and Lillian Curry, brought in Cleveland Foundation. We got Ron, we brought in Cross Country Mortgage, over 700 new jobs, two brand new hotels, a Dave's supermarket. If you want to be successful in this city, we must be collaborators. It is not you versus me. It has Thank to you be very we. much, Councilman. That's the only way we're going to take this city to the next I level. I see a few hands up here, and, and I want to get to you all on this question. Uh, we'll start with Mr. Bibb, Senator Williams, and then Congressman Kucinich. You each will have 30 seconds on this. Mr. Bibb. As we claw our way uh, out of this pandemic and fight for a more equitable economic recovery, we need a mayor who understands how to put our people back to work. Number one, we got to have a modern and responsive city hall that is business friendly. Right now, we are one of the worst cities in the country to do business with. That has to stop. we got to change that. Secondly, we have to better invest in youth employment programs to get our children back to work and invest in programs to address the adult literacy issue to ensure that our adult workforce has the skills they need to compete. Thank you very much, Mr. Bibb. Senator Williams, 30 seconds for you. Thank you very much. I'd like to say that when the Service Employees International Union came to City Hall, I was the first and only elected member at City Hall to help them turn in those signatures. I would also say this. The voters signed the petitions, and they should have their day at the polls to vote on something. I am running for mayor of the city of Cleveland. I'm not running for mayor for another city. And so if the voters here in Cleveland want a $15 minimum wage, we should work with them on that. But I believe to answer the question uh, completely, training you, is the key, and we must match uh, employers with employees to make sure they can get those jobs, those 5,000 jobs that are available. Thank you very much, Senator. Congressman Kucinich, thank you for an, your patience. It is an outrage that anybody could stand on this stage as a candidate for mayor, having been in Columbus and lobbied against the right of cities to be able to set a $15 minimum wage. I mean, let's get real here. Now, as the next mayor of Cleveland, I intend to make jobs an important issue. How will I do it? Well, we have a high level of poverty. I'll go to Washington and meet with President Biden and members of Congress who I've worked with for many years and create programs for the high poverty areas of our country, of which Cleveland is one of the highest. We'll yeah. have the resources so much, to be able to get people back to work, and we will do that. Thank you so much, Congressman. Uh, we will have to move on for time, but uh, you will have opportunities soon uh, to address these issues of the economy. Uh, well, if you mentioned you specifically, uh, I didn't call we'll give anybody's you anybody's we'll, name. We'll give you 30 the seconds, then we'll move on. If the shoe fits, wear it. Great. Well, thank you. I'll remind you that uh, you weren't here during that debate. After you lost, I don't know what you did in Cleveland, but I was here. I was talking to the owners of grocery stores. I was talking to owners of small businesses. I was talking to those that would be affected. You were talking to Fox News. And, I was in Cleveland. And you on were the talking ground. to members of no. the legislature not to increase the minimum wage. I Let's was get talking real. to the small you business the owners in the president. city of Cleveland. You were not the here. -mayor. You were not here. Co Mayor, Mayor Kelly. I would go with Mayor elect. But uh, you were not here. I was. Thank I was you talking very to people, much, and the petition committee Tis withdrew that petition. Thank you. Thank you both, gentlemen. We will move on to the next question here. We do have many questions to get to, and I hope we can hear from more of the citizens of Cleveland. Uh, it's not just a matter of job availability. It's also about the skills required to do the job. Maltrice Sharp owns a business in the central neighborhood of Cleveland and has this question. We have thousands of city residents that are looking for a good job that will provide a family sustaining wage and cannot find one for various legitimate reasons. On the flip side of that, we have businesses that are looking for qualified residents to fill open positions. What will you do to provide people with the training that they need in order to fill these positions so that these businesses can grow and scale? Senator Williams, I'll, I'll go to you first uh, on this question. How can you give uh, uh, people the skills they need to fill the positions that are open? Thank you so much for the question. Listen, uh, there are programs available through the state of Ohio that we can utilize to help employers train workers or potential workers for 
those jobs, uh, number one. But number two, as the mayor of the city of Cleveland, I believe it's very important that we take money out of the city budget and work with those employers who need to match employees and employers. That'll be a part of my responsibility as mayor. And also, you know, I've talked to businesses around the city of Cleveland about this, and they said they can't find workers. Well, I can, all, I can find a lot of employees or potential employees, so I will have a program where we will sit down, I will bring the employees and the employers to the table, and we will match those individuals up. But to really get to the root of the problem, the root of the problem is that we're graduating people who are not job ready. And so the program that I have, that I have been talking about, will make sure people are trained and Thank ready you, for school as soon as they graduate from high school in, for in-demand jobs. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Congressman Kucinich, the same question for you. How can people develop the skills they need to fill the positions that are open? It's time that we focused our educational system on preparing people for work that they can do immediately after leaving high school. Uh, the trades programs at one time in this city were very important. And today the mismatch between skills and jobs available is pretty severe. Our people have the ability to be able to do the work with a little bit of help, a little bit of coaching, a little bit of training. That's why we need to reinstitute job-specific adult education classes through the Cleveland Metropolitan School District and use those schools after school so that after people come back from their work, they can have an opportunity to better their skills. I mean, this is something that uh, should have been done for a while, but I think that uh, I agree with Senator Williams in terms of an approach that has to be structured and that can be successful if we have confidence in the people thank you very and much. they know the programs exist. Thank you very much. I've seen a few hands up. Uh, Council President Kelly, I do have you next on my list for the, for the full time. Thank you very much. This is the most critical issue facing our city and the, the, the future of our economy. That's why I put forth my Jobs Now program, where every Clevelander who wants a job, we need to make sure that we reach out to them and let them know that, that there is opportunity waiting for them. This is a clear desk moment. We are not, we have thousands of open available jobs in healthcare and manufacturing, in the skilled trades, in information services, yet people can't, they, the industry can't find the people to fill them. Yet we have unemployed and underemployed people within the same square mile of these institutions. That is not a condition that we should accept. We need to make sure that we are working with industry, with laborers, with the schools to train our citizens for the jobs that are available. And let's start with another notion. We cannot fail kids K to 12 and then think that there's a program that's gonna fix it. We have to go back deep. We have to start with in the fifth, sixth grade. That's why I'm a part of the Cleveland uh, Career Pathways Initiative. We need to solve this problem as the very basis of our economy. Council President, thank you very much. I saw a few hands up. I wanna to get to you before we move on to our next question. Uh, Mr. Bibb, you have 30 seconds. Uh, we've been talking about this issue for 20 plus years and talk is cheap. And that's why over the last 16 plus years since 2005, we've lost nearly 37% of our population. We are a, 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 a lagging city right now in terms of good job growth and good economic development. We gotta do a better job of connecting our workforce development systems and our K through 12 education system to put people to work. And the next mayor must be proactive in bringing these systems together to solve this issue long-term. Thank you very much, Mr. Bibb. Uh, Councilman Reed, you've got 30 seconds, and then Councilman Jones will go to Thank you. Thank you very much. There are 3,000 high-skilled jobs out there right now, and that's the reason I was saying earlier we need to transform and reimagine public education in the city of Cleveland. And that's the reason that on day one I am saying we need to transform Collinwood High School into a world-class, first-class vocational school. We need to bring vocation back into our schools. We need to bring art back into our schools. And I guarantee you when we do that, you will see individuals ready to go to work on day one. Thank you very much. Councilman Jones, and then you know, we'll move the on to the next question. People are talking about what they're going to do. It's just like theoretical. But I'm one of the few people here who have created jobs in Ward 7. I mean, we have to understand that. Listen, I went to Morehouse poor and I left in debt, okay? Everybody's not going to college. There are some people who have to go into the trades. So what do we do? With the help of Jeff Epstein and Midtown, we brought Magnet into, Magnet Manufacturing into our neighborhood at the old Margaret Ireland. We have to understand, 
college, Thank you manufacturing much, jobs, trades. This is how we create more jobs, and I've done it, created thousands of jobs in Ward 7. Thank you very much, Councilman. We'll move on to the next question, which is about development. We've seen that the housing market in some parts of Cleveland are hot right now, particularly on the near west side. But many neighborhoods outside those areas are still struggling to recover from the financial crash more than a decade ago. Residential tax abatements have been a part of that conversation. Jamelia Bolden, who lives downtown, has this question. How will you balance the revitalization of neighborhoods and gentrification in a mid-sized city like Cleveland? And the question is, uh, how will you balance the revitalization of neighborhoods and gentrification in a mid-sized city like Cleveland? Councilman Reed, uh, you're first up. I, I, I believe the first thing that we need to do is we need to start building affordable housing here in the city of Cleveland. The housing in the city of Cleveland is not affordable. And if we don't ensure that people have a roof over their heads, we can never ensure that we're going to be able to turn these wards and these neighborhoods into what they can be and what they should be. And therefore, what I'm saying, these vacant lots, we need to transform these vacant lots into productive lots. And I'm saying on those vacant lots, we should be starting to build new houses. We need to start building new buildings. We need to take the blight from these wards and these communities and turn it around. We should, know, we should in no way be called the poorest city in America with all the resources and all the funding that we have. And what I'm going to do, what I've said from the beginning, this election is about neighborhoods. What I am going to do is to start to invest in neighborhoods, especially the neighborhoods on the east side of the city of Cleveland. Thank you very much, Councilman. Mr. DeBello. Thanks, Nick. These six don't want you to know, but we are going to get rid of the blanket 15-year tax abatement. Beyond that, to worry about gentrification displacement, we're going to do rent caps, right? Even if you don't get displaced, you can't be asked to pay 35, 40, 45, 50 percent of your income towards your rent. So we want to revitalize every neighborhood, all 34. We want to spur development everywhere, not just a few places. And we're not trying to make wealthy people wealthier any longer. This served its purpose. We're going to get rid of that tax abatement, and we are going to create affordable transit oriented housing in all parts of town. And we are going to use our high schoolers, young adults, and those re-entering society to build on those vacant properties, right? We have way too many vacants. Those can become beautiful places with affordable prices. Thank you very much, Mr. DeBello. Senator Williams, same question for you. Then I've seen some hands up. But Senator, first to you. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, the east side of Cleveland and many other communities have never recovered since our 2008 recession. There is one person who bought her home in 1973 for $13,500. A few years ago, it was uh, uh, rated at $80,000. Her house is now worth $19,000. So we need to do something about that. Uh, number two, I think tax abatement should be used sparingly, using them only in neighborhoods who actually need abatement. When growth is happening in the community and everybody wants to go, there is no need for us to do tax abatements. I also want to touch on this half a billion dollars that I bought home in the state's last operating budget that would allow us to do what Councilman Reed said and get rid of the blight. $350 million are available right now in this city and this county to take down these abandoned or to clean up these abandoned, contaminated buildings. Number two, to build affordable housing. Senator I want to Williams, cap property you. taxes for long-term residents at no more than 10 percent per year. Thank, thank you thank so you. much. And Councilman Jones, you have 30 seconds. You know, there's a song out there say, I walk it like I talk it. I don't know if you all know that song right there. But the fact is, is that in Ward 7, the first thing I did was created a Huff Community Land Trust, not I, but we, with the Cleveland Foundation and others. And community members own this Huff Community Land Trust. Number two, what we're going to do is, as mayor, I'm going to work with the CDCs, and we are going to fund and support senior, seniors' homes. Some of them are living in homes where roofs are falling apart, porches are falling apart. We want to fix those up. And lastly, we want to make sure that we increase you, affordable housing. I'm going to do that, working with the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. Congressman Kucinich, uh, you've got 30 seconds. This is a very important question that was asked. Uh, we have to keep our seniors, help them stay in their homes that they've lived in their whole lives. So what's happening in the areas where there's been gentrification and development, seniors, the homeowners, are finding their taxes go up and their, their position in the neighborhood is threatened. 
I want to see them get some of that tax dollar back, and I intend to do that as mayor. Also, we're going to cut utility rates so that people are able to stay in their homes, because right now, the water department's sitting on a $400 million surplus. I want to see water rates cut 10 percent. Thank you, Congressman. Sewer 300, sewer rates cut 10 percent. Thank you very much. We'll turn next to Council President Kelly, then Mr. Bibb. Council President. Thank you. We just need to start with the notion that every neighborhood counts, every neighborhood can succeed, and too many of our neighborhoods have suffered from too many decades of disinvestment. And if you look at what we can do, I would encourage everyone to take a ride out to 105th Street and look at the Glen Village project that I worked with Councilman Kevin Conwell to, to get done out of the Mayor's Transformation Initiative. Look at West 25th Street. We can. The public sector is going to need to step up and provide some capital for underserved neighborhoods, but we can do it if we have that attitude. Thank you. Council President, thank you very much. Mr. Bibb. This question is so important because it speaks to this notion that the way we do economic and community development in the city is completely broken. We've got to stop this one-size-fits-all approach and invest in a hyper-local approach to better invest in people and neighborhoods all across the city. As mayor, we got to, I want to rethink our abatement policy to spur more inclusive economic growth, and we got to do a better job of investing in jobs hubs like the Opportunity Corridor, not an asphalt plant, to put people to work in neighborhoods like the southeast side. Thank you very much, Mr. Bibb. On to our next question. The latest figures from the U.S. Census Bureau show that Cleveland lost 6% of its population over the last decade, and that's despite new growth and development in some neighborhoods, as we've been talking about. Courtney Green of Glenville asks this. How do you plan to cultivate a system of support to retain our city's young professionals, specifically those who have been born and raised in Cleveland and or come from historical marginalized communities? And Mr. Bibb, we'll go back to you for the first answer. Yeah, we, we have to do a better job in this city of investing in culture, investing in young professionals, and make sure they have a seat and a voice at the table. You know, when I worked in county government, I led an initiative called the Next Generation Policy Fellowship Program that helped over 50 plus young professionals work in city government to give them a voice and, and a seat at the table to know that they have a, a decision-making process and have authority in making sure we can invest in Coyote County and in Cleveland. I want to do the same thing as mayor. I want to have a fellowship program for young people to work in city government. And we got to invest in the culture of all of our residents. We're a majority black city, and a lot of our cultural assets don't reflect that. We must do a better job of telling that narrative and, 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 and sharing that story all across this country. That's how we make sure that young people have a seat and a voice in city government. Thank you very much. Congressman Kucinich, the same question for you. Uh, how will you help uh, attract and retain young professionals in Cleveland? Well, the, the point that's being made here is that we have to remind our young people that there's a place for them in this community. And you do that through Number one, providing job opportunities, and we need to work in both government and the private sector to do that for young professionals. Number two, providing basic services in our neighborhoods, safety and, and, and keep, keeping the streets clean and, uh, and, and keeping the environment of the community uh, as clean as possible because that will attract young people to stay in. We have to make sure our entertainment districts are, are, are kept up and uh, that we attract more people in. See, Cleveland is really on the cutting edge of a whole new period of growth because we're all over the country, people are finding that their water supplies are beginning to run out. We have an abundance of fresh water here sitting on a larger supply in the Great Lakes. That is our future. That's going to help us keep young people here. Thank you very much, And it will help us attract more young people to Cleveland. Thank it's you a happening much. place. I've seen some hands up. Uh, we're going to go first to Mr. DeBello. You've got the full time for this one, and then we'll go to others. Uh, 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 we'll get to you next, if that's all right. So Mr. DeBello, you've got the full time, and then we'll get to some other rebuttals. Thanks, Nick. Sorry, Bashir. Uh, you know, we're, we are one of the only urban areas on planet Earth that can consistently loses people, election cycle after election cycle, decade after decade. You know, we're number one in the nation in poverty. Why would you want to set up shop here? We do have, you know, racially, environmentally uh, broken leadership, right? We're built this way on purpose. So we've got to start by electing better leaders, right? We're number one in the nation in child poverty. Uh, 
Community Solutions came out with a study that said for every dollar invested in eradicating child, child poverty, it returns seven dollars to the economy. For every dollar invested in public transportation, it returns five dollars back to the economy. So we don't spend our money well and we don't have good leaders and that's what we're going to change. Thank you very much, Mr. DeBello. Councilman Jones, thank you for your patience. Listen, this, this race in itself is, a, is an example that we are not preparing for young people. Uh, this race is an example. I mean, there's no succession planning in our city. Uh, there's no pathway for young people to even sit at the table. And that's the message that I want to give to every young person out there. Don't wait for your place at the table. You must come to the table because they will not be given to you. And the reality is, is that we have to be a city that gives young people opportunity. We have to make sure, and that's why under my administration, black contractors, minority businesses will do a more work and business you, with Jones. the city. When there's more opportunities, people stay. Thank you very much. Councilman Reed, we'll go to you, 30 seconds. Well, first of all, I'm young, and, and the pathway for me <laughs> was given out. I mean, I was given opportunities by Congressman Lewis Stokes. I was given opportunities by Congresswoman Stephanie Tubb Jones. I was given opportunities by Congresswoman Marsha Fudge. So if you're saying you don't have opportunities because you haven't went out there and got the opportunity, sir, and I would say what we need to do is we need to bring arts back to our communities. If you want to get these young people coming back into our communities, let's transform these vacant lots in the places where artists want to live, work, and play. And I would guarantee you when we do that, you will see more artists moving back into our communities. And we all know when artists move into our Councilman communities, Reed, thank you these very neighborhoods much. thrive. Thank you very much. I want to get a couple other people in well, on this he conversation. Did, he did mention me. I didn't mention you at all. Uh, he, he implied He implied me, so you. Uh, you, you just had some time. I want to get to some others, and we'll get back to if you. I we, can, if I can respond to that, Nick. He just implied me. I so did I, not, I, I, I will give you a, a few seconds to respond, It's going to be we'll simple. Don't worry. <laughs> Zach has been in office for 17 years and has no public success. None. He hasn't accomplished anything besides just words. Show us your legislation. Show us your homes built. Show us what you have accomplished. All you have done is talk. You're a great talker, but you got to start walking it. All right, Councilman Reed, you've got to you time out. to respond. Let's lay it out. Kinsman Road, $8.5 million project. All brand new schools in Ward 2. New office building on 139th. New senior building on 138th and Union. New housing on 144th and, 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 and Barlett. So, Mr. Jones, and with all due respect, maybe what you, Mr. Jones, to drive Mr. Down. Jones, maybe what you need to do is to ensure to know what time the council starts, so you won't miss half of the council meetings during Zoom. Oh, Zach, thank, you should be careful where you go, my friend. Thank you very much, Mr. Reed. I'm sure we'll hear more of that later. Uh, sure Senator will. Williams, you've got 30 seconds on this question, which I'll remind everyone is about attracting and retaining young professionals to Cleveland. All right, to attract and attain young professionals in the city of Cleveland, I think we have to get our schools right. We have to deal with the issue of jobs and opportunities for those people who may have gone off to college and came back and couldn't find a job, and public safety. I wanna make sure we know this. We have companies that are some of the best in our city, but we still need to attract new companies, companies where young people want to work. We also need to address the issue of African Americans and other minorities in this city not having their fair share of opportunities in small Thank you business. Very much. We must address the issue of small business and minority business. Thank you very much, Senator Williams. And uh, Council President Kelly, we'll go to you then to more questions. Thank you so much. Young families are going to go where jobs are. And we talked earlier about the, the challenges that our, that our best industries have of, of attracting people. We need to solve that problem so that there will be plentiful jobs and industry will stay and expand. They will stay in neighborhoods when they are safe and there's good schools to send them to. And while this news is disappointing, I also look at it as an opportunity to really expand how are we reaching out to our immigrant populations, our refugee populations, and other populations that we're not doing a good enough job of bringing them to Cleveland. Thank you very much, Council President. And that leads into our next question. Sonia Monroy of the Old Brooklyn neighborhood asks about small businesses, specifically those in Cleveland's Hispanic community. So when was the last time that you were in the Hispanic communities and you walked around and visited all the small businesses, the Hispanic businesses, and sat down with the owners to see their struggles and their needs before, especially now after pandemic, and what are you gonna do about it? 
Uh, Council President Kelly, you're actually first on the list, so we'll go to you with that question. Great. That is a great question. And to directly answer uh, the question, uh, last week and before that, there's some great small businesses that are opening up in, in Old Brooklyn. Uh, the 787 on Memphis Avenue by 61st Street is just a great little grocery store. I went uh, down 25th Street and met met with a lot of the, the business owners there and some of the community leaders that are really trying to get that West 25th Street corridor to thrive. Um, we're not there yet, but there is tremendous opportunity that awaits that West 25th Street corridor and all of our small businesses in the, in the Hispanic community. But I, I assume since she lives in Old Brooklyn that she has visited um, the 787 market on, on Memphis Avenue. And I, have, I believe in every single neighborhood in the city of Cleveland, but I really believe that that West 25th Street corridor, the La Centro 25, that is all ready to go. And I think that's just gonna be a great opportunity for the future. Mr. DiBello, uh, it's also for, uh, this question is also for you. You have the full time. Thank you, Sonia. Um, the last, we, one of our first debates, right, was at 4407 Lorraine, Hispanic Roundtable. And, and we sat with the Chamber of Commerce and uh, one of the leaders of the group stood up and said, hey, you know, they told us, uh, they were doing us some big favor by giving our group of small businesses $50,000 and then the next day they went and gave 1.8 million to, to one project downtown. And my thought is, A, you should have been able to say that 10, 15 years ago, whenever it happened, the $50,000 grant to a group of businesses, we need unfettered public comment at city council meetings. B, we need that public ledger, right? $50,000 is peanuts to a group of Hispanic small businesses when we know the amounts of money thrown around otherwise. So we need you to be able to communicate better to us and we need to see where our tax dollars are going and what we're spurring. Thank you very much, Mr. DeBello. Councilman Reed, same question for you about supporting Hispanic small businesses. You've got the full time. Thank you very much, Nick. Well, as the Minority Affairs Coordinator for the uh, Secretary of State, Mr. Frank LaRose, my job was to travel throughout the state of Ohio talking to minority businesses, organizations, and individuals on ways that we can grow businesses, start a business, grow a business, and maintain a business. So one of the stops that I asked the Secretary to come to was right there on West 25th, and we met with Janice Contrer. And we talked about the fact that she wants to build a Hispanic incubator right there on West 25th. And they need the funding. So you would think that a city should embrace the Hispanic community. And the fact that we've got $511 million, we should be giving a portion of that funding, like Cincinnati is doing, to the Hispanic community to grow jobs and to grow businesses. When I'm mayor of the city of Cleveland, I'm gonna take what I learned with the Secretary of State, and I'm gonna create jobs in the Hispanic community, in the Thank African American much, community, and throughout the great the city of Cleveland. Thank you very much. A few hands up on this. Uh, Councilman Jones, I saw yours first. As a city, if we wanna increase population, we must make sure that we are supporting a diverse community. Uh, the fact is, uh, you know, I was over there at the West Side Market and talking to the, resident, uh, to the, to the business owners there, and just to see how we have absolutely failed them. The Hispanic community, we failed them. So what we have to do, over 60% of business in America is small businesses. So what we need to do, what we're gonna do, is take some of the funding of the $511 million and make sure that small businesses get the grants that they need to be Thank successful. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Uh, Senator Williams, uh, you're next, 30 seconds, and I saw some others too after that. Thank you. So to directly answer your question, yes, I have sat down with Hispanic and Latinx business owners all throughout the city of Cleveland and throughout the state of Ohio. And the concern is the lack of support and the lack of resources and the difficulty in doing business in the city of Cleveland. So for me, my answer to them, as well as large businesses, we're gonna create a one-stop shop for all businesses in the city of Cleveland. We're gonna remove the red tape that currently exists. It should not take you this long Thank you, to Senator. do business in the city of Cleveland. Thank, Thank you, you very much for your time. Congressman Kucinich. Through the 16 years that I was in the United States Congress, I had a liaison to the Hispanic community who went, literally spent every day checking with businesses. Uh, his name was Luis Gomez. He has since passed, God bless his soul. But Luis reached out, and I intend as mayor, to have individuals who will, their job will be to reach out to the Hispanic business community and to see what their needs are with respect to banking Thank you, uh, Congressman. And, and marketing 
and the things that can help make a business thrive. Thank you very much, Mr. Bibb. Yeah, I was just with uh, Ricardo Leon, who runs the Metro West CDC uh, in the Clark Fulton neighborhood. And we talked about some of the pain points that we're seeing from many of our Hispanic businesses that really echo the major policy issues we see across our city. During this pandemic, it took months after months for small businesses to get the relief they deserve because we have an outdated city hall. And then secondly, we have to be a more business friendly city and it takes a mayor who can be hands on in that approach to ensure we can create good quality jobs Thank you all very across much. our community. You're tuned to the Cleveland mayoral debate, Voters First, the second debate hosted by IdeaStream Public Media and the City Club of Cleveland. We're speaking with the seven candidates who are competing in the September 14th mayoral primary. We'll turn now to two related issues, the environment and transportation. This question is from Aubrey Fox in the Jefferson neighborhood. What are your plans for our waste management system, specifically regarding our failed recycling program? Uh, if you didn't hear the question, it is what are your plans for our waste management system, sp particularly uh, regarding the failed recycling program? And Mr. Bibb, we'll go first to you. You know, it, it's a shame that it took nearly two years for uh, this mayor and council leadership to be transparent on the fact that we weren't recycling in this community. Uh, and the fact that we've you know, gone to a curbside recycling program, that's okay. But I believe as the next mayor, we gotta hit the reset button, invest in more community education to give our residents the education they need on how to recycle. We also have to do a better job as a city of investing in what, in what, what works. Um, you look at the great program that Daniel Brown started like with Rust Belt Riders that is investing in composting. It's that type of investment in community-based programs we need to address this recycling issue long-term in our city. Thank you very much, Mr. Bibb, with time to spare. And for those who may not be familiar with the ins and outs, Cleveland has uh, restarted its recycling program, but it is opt-in and it's less frequent than it used to be. Council President Kevin Kelly, where do we go from here? Thank you. The, we all need to be committed to doing better with how we treat our solid waste. And the recycling program that collapsed because of the, the international market, and we failed at educating the people in terms of when it was ending and what we were gonna do to bring the, to bring the program back. We are starting with a more limited recycling program, and it's gonna start with those goods where there is a market for, for fibers, for aluminum, for some plastics, but the days of just throwing everything in a blue bucket are over, but we can get back to a more, to, to a more robust recycling, but we, program, but we need to make sure that we're creating the economy in the city of Cleveland. We should not be shipping our recycled goods out of the city of Cleveland. We can create that local economy, create a circular economy where we do our own recycling, where we put our solid waste back into productive use, but it's going to be, it's going to take a tremendous amount of community education, and it's really going to take everybody to understand the complexities and the challenges of, the, of recycling with this market. Thank you very much, Council mm -hmm. President. Councilman Jones, we go to you, then I saw some hands up. Councilman Thank Jones. Thank you so much. You know, we found out about the issue through a press release. So number one, communication is extremely important. We have to be able to communicate with our residents. You know, dumping is a major issue in our city. I mean, a major issue. So the plan is for us to make sure that we have a great recycling, a recyclable uh, a program, but also as mayor, I'm gonna bring city services to you. I'm not gonna wait for you to come, right? City Hall has to come to you. And that's why as mayor, I'm gonna walk the streets and we're gonna fix the sidewalks. We're gonna take care of the trees and we're gonna make sure that you understand that you can trust us. We have to rebuild the trust back in this city. And I understand, I get it. If we don't listen to you, then that is why you leave the city and that is why you don't believe that we can take care of business. And as mayor, we are going to come right to your doorstep. So whether it's recyclable or recycling or whether it's dealing with the dumping issue, we want to hear from you and we want to make sure we implement the solutions that you come up with, Thank that you. we come up with together. Thank you very much, Councilman Jones. Con uh, Congressman Kucinich, 30 seconds. You cannot blame the people of Cleveland for the failures of waste management. You have to blame City Hall. And you don't want to recycle failed leadership. Congressman, thank you very much. Uh, we will go next to uh, uh, Councilman Zach Reed. Let us be clear. We have in our system a checks and balance. 
the fact that Cleveland City Council did not know that recycling had stopped in the city of Cleveland is alarming and it's a shame. Let's be clear. As the Congressman said, you cannot blame this on the citizens of the city of Cleveland. You gotta lay the blame where it actually is. It's at City Hall. And I've said, when I'm mayor, we are going to fix city services in this city. Thank you very much, uh, Councilman Reed. Uh, Senator Williams, thank you for your patience. And Mr. DeBello, I saw you too. Thank you very much for uh, the question. Listen, um, as mayor, you have to be transparent and you have to be honest with the people you have been elected to represent. And that's what you will get from me. If I were not going to be dumping your uh, recyclables there, you would have known about it. That's the first thing we have to do, make sure we're honest with people. Secondly, I think we need to teach people where their recycling goes. There are so many rules about what you can recycle, what you can't recycle, who can go Thank where. You very much, Senator. We need to make sure people are educated in our city about how to recycle. Thank you very much, Mr. DeBello. 30 seconds for you. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, uh, really we should just be blaming the Fox 8i team, right? Or else we wouldn't be having this discussion. There'd still be the two trucks and what other city is having this discussion? Uh, of course we need to do recycling, just pay the $7 million. Justin's right, we need to start composting. And further beyond that, we have a place that's been wrecked in an environmental justice sense. We need more trash cans, we need to convert more parks. Um, this goes well beyond recycling, so thank you. Great, thank you very much. We'll move on to another environmental issue. One of Cleveland's biggest environmental assets is Lake Erie. And uh, Zach Kaiser of Tremont has this question about our Great Lake. Lake Erie and the rest of the Great Lakes are the largest bodies of freshwater in the country. As access to freshwater becomes increasingly scarce and further commodified, what specific environmental policy would you champion to preserve Lake Erie for generations to come? Councilman Reed, how would you preserve Lake Erie? Well, first of all, I want to thank you for the question. Uh, the first thing that I would do is I would say that I would do like Carl B. Stokes did. I would go to the I would go to our river and basically say this is a great asset, and we need to preserve it. The one thing that I would do that I, I had 11 years working for the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, so my job for 11 years was to preserve the natural resources throughout the state of Ohio. So I've got a long history of doing something about natural resources here and preserving natural resources. The other thing I would do for our lake, is I, I would work with our senators and our people in Washington, D.C. to ensure that individuals know that dumping fertilizer and the whole lights and coming down to our natural resources, it's not, it's not, it's not negotiable. We are not going to accept it. So we need to work with our leaders in Washington. We need to work with our leaders in Columbus to ensure that we've got this fresh body of water it's a great natural resources, and we are going to preserve it by any means necessary. Thank you very much, Councilman Reed. Congressman Kucinich, you've got the full time for this. How would you preserve Lake Erie? As a member of Congress, I, was, I, I helped to uh, move a joint commission, U.S.-Canadian commission, to stop the taking of bulk water resources out of Lake Erie. Lake Erie is absolutely our future. It is our health. It is the path for Cleveland to reestablish itself nat uh, nationally. Specifically, I want to see uh, tree planting along waterways to stabilize banks. I want to help uh, create floating wetlands to help purify the water uh, that's near, near the uh, shore. Uh, beyond that, we need to stop the use of pesticides and herbicides by City Hall and help our residents learn how they can use non-toxic means of lawn care, and, uh, uh, for example. This, this lake is so precious to us, and as the next mayor of the city of Cleveland, I am fully prepared to lead the way to protecting it as a natural resource, you, as our source of water, recreation, everything that it does. Thank you very much. Senator Williams, I had you on my list for the, for the full time for this question, and then my apologies to those with their hands up. We will have to move on. We're getting close to the end. Uh, Senator Williams. Well, thank you very much for the question. Uh, the first thing I would do is make sure that our water purification system is working properly. It's a good system now, but we always need to make sure we're doing our checks and balances. We don't want to act or be like the uh, 
city in Michigan. That's the first thing. Secondly, I will continue to work with the Ohio EPA as well as the coalitions that are currently in place in the state of Ohio with our surrounding cities, making sure we're all on the same page when it comes to protecting our bodies of water. As you all know, years ago, the in the area of um, Toledo, Ohio, they had the algae blooms that caused all types of problems. We have to be uh, proactive when we come to protecting our waterways, and I will do that working with surrounding communities and surrounding states and the federal and state level. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. We are going to move on to the next question, but I'll make sure you guys have opportunities to jump in soon. Uh, we can't talk about protecting the environment by cutting greenhouse gases without talking about transportation. Lauren Welch of the Edgewater neighborhood asks this. How would you improve the city's transportation infrastructure to make public transportation available to everyone and how would you fund it? Uh, Mr. Bibb, uh, this question will go to you first. How will you make transportation available and how will you fund it? Well, I have a lot of uh, experience dealing with this issue having served on the board of RTA for nearly three years and affordable public transit is about access to getting to a doctor's appointment. It's about access to, to getting to a good paying job. It's about access to getting to school. And we as a city must take a more proactive role to invest in quality public transit all across our city. Number one, the next, the next mayor must work with the CEO of RTA and other key leaders in our community to explore additional, additional revenue sources to better invest in public transit. Secondly, as mayor, I wanna create a department of mobility and transportation inside city government so we can better invest in transit-oriented development, but also better invest in multimodal mobility solutions so that our residents can get the access to good transit they deserve and need. And as mayor, I'm going to make sure I appoint members of the board to RTA that reflect the real lived experience that our riders see day in and day out. Thank you very much, Mr. Bibb. Uh, Ross DeBello, same for you. You've got the full time. Thank you, Lauren. Um, we want to restore popularity and ridership to pre-2006 levels, right? We've lost money, we've lost riders, this is a downward spiral. So the first thing we're going to have to do is fight, fight, fight for funding. We know we're getting $511 million, uh, RTA is getting 200, you know, uh, 300, the county is getting 200, but that is not perpetuating and sustainable, right? So countywide, we may have to look at some new forms of taxation. We may have to tax parking, right? Because what we want to do is make it more popular and make it more affordable. We want to get to free fares, and if not free, an income-based fare payment. We also want to make it more friendly and clean. We don't want fare evasion being enforced. We want all door boarding. We want more routes. You need a route within 10 minute walk of wherever you live. So this is going to take work. Thank you very much, Mr. DeBello. Council President Kelly, I'll go to you uh, for the full minute. Then I saw some hands. Thank you. Transportation is critical to getting to jobs, to getting to school, to getting to doctor's appointments. It is something that we have to focus on like a laser. And what we as a community need to do is we need to realize where the real enemy is, and that's in Columbus. The state funding to RTA, to public transportation, is shameful. And we all need to use our collective political uh, lobbying ability to make sure that we get more funding for public transportation. And that's got to be the job of the next mayor, to always be lobbying for that. But in addition to public transportation via the Greater Cleveland RTA, we need to make sure we're advocating for smart policies, transit-oriented development. We need to make sure that we realize that transportation is, is key. We need to, every time we do a road project, we need to make sure that we have complete and green streets. We need to make sure that with Vision Zero, we make sure our roadways are safe. We identify those intersections. But most of all, we need to realize that most people care most about the roads that they drive on, the streets, their side streets. That's why I Thank tripled the much, budget Council for President. residential side streets, and we're making great strides there. Thank all you. All right, I saw uh, Councilman Jones first. You've got 30 seconds. All right, real quick, and I know everybody's not a fan of this man, but we got to put some respect on his name, and that's Carl Stokes. Without Carl Stokes, there is no EPA, the Clean Water Act. Our lake has to be not only good for the ecosystem, but also the economy, really important. The second thing when it comes to transportation, I want to be clear, as mayor, it's all about being a champion. No institution will be in this city and not put residents first. The residents will be first. 
We want to hear their thoughts and their concerns. It doesn't make sense that Thank you, you have an RTA that removed, removed some buses from different communities without allowing the community members to have any say so about it. Thank you very much, Councilman. Uh, uh, Councilman Reed, we'll go to you and then Senator Williams. Well, let's first of all put, uh, call it like it is. First of all, a mayor needs to put board members that understand the importance of transportation. And we talk about people walking the walk and talking the talk. When the mayor of the city of Cleveland shut down Public Square and didn't allow buses to go through, board members didn't say anything. Board members didn't step to the plate. It took citizens like myself to go out there and demand that we open this, this public square back up because people were being late to work, their doctor's appointments, and going where they needed to go because a mayor stepped up, closed down public square, and it took you, citizens Councilman. like me and others to get it open. So I do need to move on. Uh, Mr. Bibb, I'll give you a couple seconds to respond because the board was mentioned. Well, I, I wasn't on the board uh, during that time, uh, with all due respect, Councilman Reed. So um, and, and I also want to say this. Uh, as mayor, I'm going to do everything in my power to not only open up the buses back to Public Square, but we got to remove those Jersey barriers, too, because folks are sick and tired of that as well. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, Senator Williams, very briefly, then we got to go to the last question and closing statements. Very, uh, thank you very much. Listen, I just brought home $33 million for transportation funding. And for the first time in Ohio's history, I was able to get the Greater Cleveland Regional Transit Authority um, on the track system. That's with the Ohio Department of Transportation so that they could replace the rail cars that we have. This has never happened in the history of the city of Cleveland. Secondly, because so many of our residents are traveling outside of Cleveland to go to work, we need to have direct transportation for those individuals not to have to catch two and three buses to get to work, but make sure that we are working with employers and working in the neighborhoods where those employees work to get Thank them directly much, to Senator. their location. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if I saw any other uh, rebuttals here. Uh, Congressman Kucinich, 30 seconds, and I believe uh, that will be wrapping us very soon. Congressman. I helped form the Regional Transit Authority, and, and the basis for it was this, low fares, increasing the frequency and distribution of service. Our population is greatly different now. We need to make sure the services go to where people live. RTA's plan, new plan doesn't necessarily do that. So I'm going to see that plan reevaluated. You know, after the plan was put into effect, there were people on the east side who said they couldn't get to work because the bus, uh, they had to walk three blocks to get to catch a bus. We're going to change it and make sure that the transit dependent are able to get access to being able to a bus uh, nearby. Thank you very much, Congressman. It's time now, believe it or not, for closing remarks. I wish we could go a few more hours. Uh, the order was determined at random earlier. Candidates, you will have 60 seconds to uh, deliver your closing remarks. We begin with Ross DeBello. Thank you, Nick. Let me be clear, Cleveland. We need significant change. Let me be clear. We're not going to get it with any one of these six. Let me be clear. I want this damn job. Let me be clear about what separates me from these six. I want full-blown public comment and participatory budgeting of every penny. I want to end the 15-year blanket tax abatement. I want to stop giving our tax dollars to millionaires and billionaires. I want to start a public bank. Let me be clear about how some of my opponents see and use crime. A few of them want to add hundreds of officers. One of them wants to take the officers working at desks and put them onto the street. This either means that they simply don't get the root causes of crime or that they perfectly get it they just don't care about our mental well-being and the level of discourse. These six are more of the same. My plan's at RossDiBello.com. I'm asking for your vote because I want this job. Thank you very much, Mr. DeBello. Congressman Kucinich, your closing statement. Some of uh, my opponents in this race are referring to me as uh, Dennis the Menace. Uh, let me assure them. That's correct. Yes, I am a menace. I'm a menace to violent criminals who are running in the streets. I'm a menace to banks who redline. I'm a menace to utilities which price gouge people. I'm a menace to crooked politicians who steal from the taxpayers and to those who look the other way. People of Cleveland know me and they trust me. They know I put my career on the line to save Muni Light. And today we still have public power, but we'll see the residential rates reduced when I get in. People know I stand up for them. 
I speak out for them, that they can rely on me when the chips are down, when everyone else fails them, the people of Cleveland know I'll be there for them. Go to Kucinich.com to join our campaign to restore government to the people for the city of Cleveland. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman. Council President Kevin Kelly. Thank you, Nick. I want to thank you, and I want to thank all the candidates and everybody that helped put this together. This has been a very, very lively two, uh, two debates that we went through. And hopefully the viewers really understand by watching this that these are serious times for the city of Cleveland. These are critical moments. This is no time for a quantum leak backwards. This is no time for, say, anything politics to, to determine this. And it's no time for on-the-job training. These are serious times, not times for platitudes, not times for on-the-job training. I want to thank the people of Ward 13 who have elected me to this position. And I want to thank my colleagues who elected me as President of Cleveland City Council. This has prepared me well to be your mayor. We need a competent, experienced mayor who's ready to lead on day one, and that's what I will bring to this job. Thank you very much. I look forward to your support. Thank you, Council President. Senator Sandra Williams. I'd like to thank each and every one of the sponsors who have put this event on tonight. It really gives you an opportunity to learn more about who will be your next mayor. And I truly believe the next mayor of Cleveland will be me. I am officially asking for your vote, not because I am the only woman in this race, but because I am the most qualified person. We are at a critical juncture right now. We have so many issues to address in the city of Cleveland that have gone unfaced for a very long time. I believe the history, my job history, has prepared me for this big task. I've served this country in the United States Army Reserve. I have served 10 and a half years in the field of law enforcement. I have served in the state legislature fighting for you, bringing home dollars to help transform this city. We have too much at stake to leave this city in the hands of somebody or anybody who is not prepared. I believe I am that leader and I'm officially again asking you for your support. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Next, we'll hear the closing statement from Justin Bibb. What you heard tonight is that the great promise of what our city can become is so real, but the failed politics of the past won't get us there. Now in this election, we have an opportunity to elect bold, new, visionary leadership that partners with you to move our city forward. And that path starts by putting people and our neighborhoods first. Now, I know that government alone can't create change, but people like you that live these issues and see these issues day in day, and day out, you are the ones that can help the next mayor create change. You deserve for your voice to be heard for safer neighborhoods, for more accountable policing, for better educational opportunities for our young people so they can achieve their God-given potential. I'm Justin Bibb, I ask for your vote to, to ensure we can make this moment into a movement. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Bibb. Uh, next, we will hear a closing statement from Councilman Bashir Jones. You know, my mother, her name was Imani, and she passed away from breast cancer 11 years ago. And I can remember sleeping in shelters in Cleveland, and she would tell me, Bashir, true success is not about what you gain, but it is about what you give. I can remember sitting with Tim Roberts from the Brick Program and Reverend Kavanis and others and Reverend Moss and sitting down with these great men like Kali Samad and Imam Abbas who would say to me and Mike Nelson who said, you know what, you can go off to Morehouse, but make sure that you come back to the city and work. Listen, we need a generational change. That's crystal clear. But also let me be clear that even within our own generation, there is a difference. I'm not just someone who just walking, but it's somebody that talked it. I worked with great thought leaders and leaders in this community who assisted me. I had the success of being a public official, but I have even more success of being a public servant. Please go to BashirForCleveland.com, follow us, follow your journey. I'm asking for your vote and your prayers. God bless. Thank you very much, Councilman. And closing us out tonight is Councilman Zach Reed. Thank you very much. My name is Zach Reed and I'm running for mayor of the city of Cleveland. All elections are about the future. And when you look up 
and you look over the horizon, and as we go down this pathway to elect the next mayor of the city of Cleveland, think about it. One candidate has been endorsed by someone who's been in office for 16 years and has failed at every regard when it comes to making our city safer, providing city services, and reducing poverty. And yet they talk about change. Another one tomorrow will stand with someone by the name of Mayor Michael R. White and receive his endorsement, Justin Bibb, who was mayor over 20 years ago. But yet we talk about progress and we talk about change. You need someone on day one like myself that has the experience to go down there and ensure that our city is going to be safer, that we're going to reduce poverty, and that we're going to provide city services to everyone throughout this city. My name is Zach Reed, and I'm asking for your vote on September the 14th. Well, thank you all for joining us for the second of two mayoral debates in this primary election cycle here in the city of Cleveland. This debate was produced by IdeaStream Public Media in partnership with the City Club of Cleveland. Our media partners are the Press Club of Cleveland and Neo Sojo, the Northeast Ohio Solutions Journalism Collaborative. Our thanks to the candidates for participating in this debate. Thank you all very much for spending the time, for answering the questions, and for having a respectful and honest conversation with each other. Also want to thank uh, the voters in this community and all the community members who submitted questions to help fuel this conversation. And I will remind you, early voting is underway. For an in-depth look in the candidates, into the candidates and into the issues in this election, please check out my podcast, After Jackson, Cleveland's Next Mayor, available at ideastream.org, NPR One, or wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm Nick Castell. Thank you for joining us, and good night. Mayoral Debate, Voters First, is made possible by grants from the Cleveland Foundation and the George Gunn Foundation. Cleveland Mayor Frank Jackson is retiring, and for the first time in 16 years, City Hall is getting a new boss. What do the seven candidates offer? What do voters want? And how does politics in Cleveland really work? I'm Nick Castell, host of the new podcast, After Jackson, Cleveland's Next Mayor, from Ideastream Public Media. Check out After Jackson, Cleveland's next mayor, wherever you get your